Um, before we get going, did anybody have anything they wanted to add to the agenda for today? Um, I'll scroll down so you can see the part of the agenda that isn't the connection details. Can everybody hear me? Just to make yeah. sure I'm not. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, you're good. I once did a webinar where I got about five minutes in before somebody pointed out that they couldn't hear me. Um, so anything to add to our agenda? Uh, it's the beginning of the new year, so uh, we might end up mostly having a bit of a review of where things are at. Uh, if anybody does have anything to add as we go along, uh, please don't hesitate to unmute yourself or stick it into the chat. Uh, we have quite a, a list of newly added and newly updated bugs. Um, the last meeting we had was in October. So these are all bugs that have either been added or updated since uh, I think it was October 11th or 12th. Um, some of the newly added bugs have also been newly updated, but I only put them in one list. So there are some newly added bugs that are also updated. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, there were a couple of bugs that I wanted to flag. Um, there may be some others in this list um, that others would like to speak to. Um, the first one uh, that was on my list uh, is just uh, the load mark order records, the uh, idea to have an option to export import templates. Uh, this applies both to uh, newer versions of acquisitions, as well as uh, the batch import export for catalogers. Um, so if you or catalogers uh, in your library or system think that this uh, make sense, uh, please do um, come and add some heat to this um, or just raise some awareness of it. Uh, Ruth? Yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment about this, something that we discovered, and I just updated bug uh, 2039609, which is Sprint A for acquisitions, um, which is in bug fix right now with Equinox. Um, one of the things that we discovered because we're working with the um, brief records that utilize the, the templates is, but they don't use the templates in the same way that uh, the uh, Mark Enhanced Editor does. So like the holdings, the, you mean? the holdings templates, yeah. Oh, no. No, the mock templates. I'm sorry. I'm thinking maybe a different thing. Are you looking oh, at? Sorry. You're thinking the the default mark templates. That's correct. Yeah. So I'm thinking something else. Sorry, uh, it was a friend of mine. <laughs> no problem. Um, so what I'm thinking of is when you do the um, either the load act records or the mark batch import export, you can pick things like uh. Uh, fiscal year and provider right. and apologies. all of yep. those bits. So that is what I'm hoping long-term uh, can have export import options like we do with the holdings templates and spine labels and I, uh, oh, um, checkout receipts. I was like, I know there's another big one. Mm -hmm. um, so just making a plug for if anybody else is interested in this one. Um, and then we have two that have uh, a need for discussion uh, that are new bugs. So one of them is uh, whether or not we actually need um, to have the new brief record on the acquisitions menu. Um, and let me let me just pull up, which I should have done earlier, but let me pull up one of the community servers so we can look at what I'm talking about.
And just bear with me because I'm going to have to register here. While you're pulling that up, I will say that, I mean, it, removing it from the menu doesn't remove it from Evergreen. There's still the ability to add a brief record if you are either in a selection list or um, in a purchase order. Um, I don't. And those I, are the places that you would normally do it. Right. Yeah. I can't think of a workflow where you would start with a brief record and then add it to something. I could see where you would be in something and then discover I need to add a brief record. Yeah. And yeah, that, that makes makes sense. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the place where you're creating a brief record from that menu, it only offers you a chance to put it on a selection list. And that's not really cool to me. Yeah, especially yeah. if libraries aren't using selection lists. Um, right. Which I'm going to try to move my libraries away from that once we move over, because we're not going to need that safety net anymore. Yeah. So um, in the, the development that we're testing right now, which I, I don't feel like I can share that, but you, you can add to a PO from the brief record. Again, I mean, it's really, it's really nice to have it from the menu for testing because you can just go directly in and test just brief records rather than having. But other than that, like as an actual functional workflow. I just couldn't come up with a scenario where you'd use it in actual practice, but I don't work doing acquisitions in a library. So if there's anybody here who does and uses selection lists or purchase orders and uses the brief records, and you can see a reason why you'd start with the brief record rather than create your selection list or purchase order first, um, please do speak up. Because if somebody has a, a workflow that uses that, I have no objection to keeping it. I just, if there's no need for it, I think it would make sense to remove it from the list. The documentation I have for our library doesn't even mention it coming from this menu. We, I use it, start it within um, the purchase order itself. So if it goes away, we won't cry. Yeah, and I think that whenever you can like economize <laughs> these menus to for workflows, that is a positive thing. You, I mean, you don't want to over economize, but hmm. maybe sometimes I do want to over economize. Um, feel free to add to the bug um, if people have other thoughts on this, um, but I'll update and actually I can update that right now. Uh, and Tiffany has uh, popped in to say uh, that she also, and it's back from October, um, is in favor of removing it. Um, so yeah, so feel free to jump on this bug, um, add updates uh, to it or say that it affects you if you also think it makes sense to remove that. Um, and then the other one that says discuss um, is whether or not uh, the brief record should include an identifier field. Um, that is a delightful question, isn't it? Yeah. See also pre-cat items. And I feel like Christine Morgan is referring to a suggest. Oh, ha, huh, there we go. There's where my suggestion came from. Um, sorry, let's track back to, oh, I suggested it shouldn't be in there so we should just let evergreen actually do what it automatically does when you create regular mark records um so can you yep I'm gonna pop back so when i think of identifier i'm thinking of a standard identifier like a zero two zero or something like that you, this looks like it's referring to a database id I believe which gets populated into the zero zero one yeah, automatically. Just check and see what the mark standards say here. So 
So yeah, it's the control number. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't um, think, I don't think that that should be something that goes in there. That's something that's automatically created. Yeah. So if we come back to evergreen and we're going to use it right off the menu. Yeah, we are <laughs> again. <laughs> testing. testing. Yep. Um, and because this is dojo, it's just going to take a moment to load, <laughs> but then I, having tested the new one, it is very pretty. And I can't, it, maybe I can, I don't know if I can, I should have that. And maybe it'll show for me. There we go. Um, so identifier right here, because you and can see have ISBN, ISSN, and UPC um, as fields. And this identifier field isn't as one might automatically as assume, like you did, Ruth, um, that it is those fields. It's actually the control number, which is the 001, which Evergreen creates that unique database ID for the... Um, but the TCN and the database ID may or may not be the same depending on your system. And I think, yeah, so the 001 is definitely an evergreen. Yeah, that's a database ID. Yeah. So I don't, um, sorry, go ahead, well, Mary. For us, the, for us, the 001 is like the OCLC number or the vendor ID number. Um, it's not the, the um, record ID from evergreen. That goes somewhere else in our system. Oh, so it doesn't. So, so you yeah, actually it's, it's would... not a it's not a given that the O one is going to be the evergreen ID number, right? And I think that has to do with the global flag, right? Um, whether you have it set to use the TCN as or the use a database ID as a the T well not a TCN right. but as as this identifier here. Uh, for us, the the identifier number ends up in tag nine hundred one. Uh, which so which subfield? Um, I want to say C, but I'm not sure if that's right. Because I found a disparity between A and C as well, based on mm -hmm. this number. <laughs> I, I believe C is the database ID. Okay. So for us, that's the only place you're going to see the database ID in the mark record is the nine hundred one C. <laughs> so it maybe doesn't actually make sense to remove that from the brief record because mary are your library staff needing to put in that control number they're, they're not needing to do brief records 99 percent of the time anyway and if they did they wouldn't really know what the oclc number was supposed to be because they're not using it we use it on their behalf so it's kind of moot but i'm a little confused by this term identifier is also used in the purchase order line items. Um, there's an identifier field and it's a drop down and it's drawing from the O2O 0 in the O24, but it, the late it's labeled as identifier. So this term is kind of problematic anyway. Mm -hmm. And Samantha's just put into the um into the chat here, is it possible if we keep this to change the label? We've had several tickets where people are unable to create their brief records because they assumed this was the ISBN. Um, and I actually believe if we go to acquisitions administration, and I'm not sure if it's the server being slow or my system, so apologies. Um, and if we go to I think it's the line item mark attributes definition. I think you can act if you have the ability, you can actually change that in your own system. Mm -hmm. Or and there you go, it says one yeah. right there. So uh, the definition of what number it's looking for, oh one is right there in the in the X path. Yeah. Um, I might uh I might break the test server, but it's a test server. So let's see uh, if we do control number there. Um, and come back to the brief record.
you might have to restart things to make it. No, it changed. Control number. Yeah, there it is at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. If needed, I would definitely check with whoever makes sense at your organization because I don't know what other effects it may have. But Evergreen if, will let you change it if you have access to that interface. Um, so I think the conclusion, um, oops, let me find the right bug here, um, is that it should be, it should remain, but it should be renamed um, in stock because identifier is confusing. Right. Does that make sense? I think so. I don't think it would hurt to have some additional documentation. I know that's terrible to say, <laughs> but some documentation that, that's, that point. Big meets the beginning of February, come right along. To, to provide a link to if there is documentation, which there may be uh, for how to change that language um, to link it yeah. in there. If not, then for somebody to create the documentation. Um, I will update the bug report with what we've discovered. Um, I will not promise to create the documentation, but I'll get it added to the list of needs for DIG. Perfect. Excellent. So those are the two newly added bugs that needed discussion. I'm just going to come back to the list here. Um, is there anything else under the newly added bugs that people have questions or comments or just want to flag? Um, some of these we will be circling back to when we get to the regression bugs. And as somebody who's tested Sprint A, I'm really excited for whenever that ends up in Evergreen. It's pretty solid. I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> well, a lot more dojo goes away. So much more. <laughs> yes. Um, so moving on to the newly updated, um, there really wasn't anything in here that I wanted to myself to pull out because uh, other than the ones that uh, are included in the regression bugs. Um, but I don't know if there's anything here that anyone else has uh, come up against or wanted to mention. Um, actually, the one I will flag is uh, this one, because um, I know some others have run into this. And this is that if you are using the new Angular load mark order record screen, um, it does only accept the current year unless you add additional fiscal years in your database. Um, we're using it um, when we upgraded to 3.11.1. Um, we had uh, 2022 manually added in our database because we have some libraries that are uh, that straddle uh, fiscal years. So they have 2022 and 2023 calendar years in one fiscal year. Um, and Evergreen has automatically added 2024 um, for us as we're now in the 2024 calendar year. Um, so that is working for us, but we did have to manually add 2022 when we upgraded to 311. Um, so if anybody else is looking at upgrading to a version that uses that load mark order record in Angular, um, just highlighting that that is something um, that you'll need to make sure to include as part of your upgrade. Um, is anybody else using the Angular load mark order records with that now? We're about a month away from moving to it. But and I don't think this affects us as much because none of our libraries are loading fund information with their mark order, order records. We, we just have them uh, apply the fund after it's been, uh, the purchase order has been created. Sometimes it's cleaner that way. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not, we, sorry, go ahead. Um, we just started using it this week. We upgraded to 310. I haven't gotten any feedback yet from our libraries. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's going to be good it's on your upgrade. <laughs> Thank you. We've been using it and I have found that I have to manually change the um, <clears throat> um, uh, the org unit fiscal year because we name our fiscal years, you know, starting with the initial, you know, so like 2023, 2024. So since we're in the middle of that fiscal year right now, I've had to go into the or unit setting and change it from 2024 back to 2023 in order to be able to select um, the actual fiscal year in load mark order records are you sorry just to make sure i'm understanding Lindsay. are you mm -hmm. talking about once it loads yeah um, oh sorry i've got all sorts of zoom bits on top of my screen um so you're talking about this yes so when it's default it will default to the current calendar year but if that's not how you record your split fiscal year then you have to manually change it to whatever that year is that's really good to know because i think some of our libraries are having to manually do it every time and i didn't realize that it was actually talking to the fiscal calendar here yeah it's weird because we couldn't even manually change it so I don't know. So we had to have additional fiscal years added in the server. Mm -hmm. um, and then once it's at the actual point of, uh, you know, loading records, switch them over. And this without fail takes me by surprise with the new calendar year or when the fiscal year shifts, because of course, all of our libraries seem to have different random fiscal years as well so that's it's actually kind of a big issue and so. I know I think we're like getting really close and I saw it on the menu here um though so I so swear we don't have this interface on our 311 um I feel mm -hmm. like we're like almost at the point of having fiscal years and calendars working in a way that we can actually control and understand <laughs> but i feel like acquisitions just isn't quite there yet well i'm i'm very hopeful <laughs> yeah um i'll have to go back and look at our production because i don't remember that um being an option say so i'm looking at at our bug fix interface, which is, I mean, bleeding edge-ish, and it does not have this page that you're showing. Let me see if I can just. The wiki says that Equinox's server is running 311.1, but I'm wondering, oh no, it's running 312. There we go. Yes, oh, the, the fiscal calendar administration screen was a new thing that I think Tiffany wrote and it, it ended up in 312. Yeah. Okay, so maybe this is not actually that bleeding edge. This might be 311 too. Yeah. So well, that, good. No, this is 312. <laughs> good because otherwise we need to develop an interface. Yeah. But we don't. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. You're amazing. <laughs> Done. So now I'm going to have to go to that one because now I'm super curious. So yeah, so now we have in 312 the ability to create new fiscal years and new fiscal calendars. And we can see that currently it only has the default. Um, I'm going to add this to the documentation list. Uh, no, fiscal year.
Um, cause yeah, we haven't looked at this yet. Um, so maybe, uh, Lindsay, this is the final piece for making things easier. Yeah, it looks like it. So I am eagerly anticipating an upgrade to 312. <laughs> well, and it's That's on the Equinox exciting. community server. So yeah, I'll test that. Go poke. <laughs> Fun discovery. Yeah. Um, so that is fiscal year load, uh, mark order records. Um, if we come back to the agenda here, um, is there anything else in the newly updated list that anybody wants to talk about? This is sort of tangentially, uh, related maybe, mm -hmm. um, because it occurred to me, I was looking at the last uh, bug on the list, the EDI file transfer needs to be smarter. I am currently having a hellacious go round with Brodart EDI messages. So I don't know who did what when, but somewhere buried in there, there's um, <clears throat> a related bug that is um, pertains to um, SFTP, SSH, SSL kind of protocols. And um, Jason Stevenson, I forget which uh, system he's with, um, has done a lot of work on that one. And talking about issues with the Evergreen EDI system, which is this huge black hole to me. Um, and work done to start implementing SFTP. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how other people are managing some of their EDI transfers because I hate it with a fiery passion. And also whatever happened with Brodart, we are generating um, EDI order messages, but then they disappear. So. Oh, I don't know if that's because they are now apparently using SFTP and I don't know if it's that Evergreen can't cope or they can't cope or somebody else did something weird. I don't know. I feel like I saw something <laughs> about Brodart come up on the Evergreen IRC channel sometime mm. near the end of 2023. So but they did some big work on their something in October. It's not a vendor that we use, so I read it and kept going. Yeah, I'll I'll have to poke around some more because I have literally been trying to get a straight answer from somebody, anybody, anywhere since November of 2023. Yeah, so I don't Is know. There is there anyone else um, here today whose libraries use Brodart and do EDI with it? I feel like Pines does, but I don't mm. know if we have anybody from Pines here today. Yeah, I don't know. I was kind of under the impression that we're like extra special when it comes to, you know, really kind of pushing acquisitions in like weird and novel ways. So I don't know. Um, while we're talking about EDI, um, and it's sounding mm. like Samantha's going to check because it sounds like maybe they're having similar issues. Um, a quick poll of the group. Who has moved all of their EDI over to the new EDI attributes? Anyone? We haven't. <laughs> yet I do not believe that we have but it sounds like we should um actually I believe we use EDI attribute sets and Lindsay can you remind me what organization you're with I'm with uh Westchester right thank you yes we use EDI attribution sets and I inherited them along with the entirety of acquisitions. And I still, to this day, am not really positive of what actually they do. They're terrifically confusing. And as far as I can tell, there's no documentation. Well, so I believe 
<laughs> Tiffany has moved all of Pines over to EDI attributes. Uh, oh. EDI attributes set. But uh, unless somebody else. On we do call, have ours. I take it back. <laughs> so Indiana. So it, this is, I mean, the last time we asked about this uh, several meetings ago, I'm not sure when it last came up, but Pines was the only one who had fully made the move at that point. Um, yeah, so I'll have to, to rescan everybody's documentation. I do that periodically. <laughs> so now, I'm going to steal everything from Pines. If you haven't seen them, though, Lindsay, um, Tiffany did create some EDI <gasps> stuff oh on the wiki here. Okay. Um, so there is the EDI fields used in Evergreen and EDI troubleshooting. And I believe both of these are talking about... Yeah, so it talks about the EDI attribute. Um, this is what we were using when we were working on uh, making the move. Um, but there's a bug that has to be resolved before we can do it okay. for our main provider. And it's a Canadian provider. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's one of those bugs where we have to to get things resolved because nobody else uses it. Okay. Or at least I don't think any of you are ordering from United Library Services out of Calgary, Alberta. Any minute now, Westchester is going to because we are that extra. There we go. <laughs> uh, no, this is awesome tying this? to the Edifact. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. I love Tiffany. Policy. She's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Tiffany, you know, big props to Tiffany for putting that information in there. Um, yes. Might make sense later in the year to do an acquisitions call where we focus on talking about EDI again. Um, so if that's something that would be useful for others, um, I'll let Tiffany know that maybe that's a spring conversation. I mean, if nothing else, just some sort of like, you know, trauma circle where we can just sort of, you know, like support group. <laughs> Well, this is the acquisitions interest group. That's, you know. <laughs> there we go. Um, and I see we've had a few comments. Um, Ruth thinks the fiscal calendar admin is amazing, which is excellent. Um, Samantha says they have one library that uses EDI with Brodart. And Christine Morgan says we have not either only new providers added or set up to use EDI attribute sets. So... Um, I'll put on the list EDI and uh, we'll circle back to that in a bigger way um, when Tiffany is back because she is uh, the expert on EDI, at least much more of an expert on it than I am. Um, was there anything else related to that, uh, Lindsay? No, not really. I mean, I'm still, yeah, and like a not great EDI headspace at the moment, but that is certainly super helpful. Excellent. Well, and... <laughs> oh, uh, I'm going to add a tag to this one because it didn't come up in my search because it doesn't have the generic act tag. So we've got that EDI uh, SFTP bug that you referred to is that one. Um, and it does look like there is a fix from November, but Galen has found some issues. Um, so more to come. Uh, okay, back to the agenda. Uh, anything else under the newly updated or related to the newly updated? Okay, so I'm just going to close some of these bugs so we can find the next tab here. Um, so I included a link to it in the agenda. Um, and this is just a search of uh, Launchpad where the tickets have the tag ACK and they have the tag regressions. Um, and I just wanted to flag these because we have run into some issues uh, since upgrading to 311 uh, with some regressions that we're seeing. Um, the 
And I wanted to, you know, highlight them. So if any others are moving towards this, you're aware. Um, and also just to get some more awareness around some of these. Uh, one that's uh, a significant issue, which we've talked about in the EDI, sorry, not EDI, now I've got EDI on the brain, um, in the ACK interest group before is this one, which is um, that you can't edit your fund after your PO has been activated in the new Angular purchase orders. Um, it is possible to update that in your database, um, whoever has access to that. Um, and you can also go back to the legacy, the dojo, um, and do that update. Um, it'll depend on whether you are, uh, whether you're wanting to redirect libraries back to that um, dojo interface. Um, for us so far, we're just making the changes for the libraries because we don't want to send them back to um, to make changes in the other one and have them have to use two interfaces. Um, so just flagging that one, we did talk about it in AC, the AC interest group in the past. Um, and we do consider that the, the AC interest group at that time uh, did come to the conclusion that this is a blocker bug for having that purchase order dojo interface completely removed. Um, so there's that one. Um, another one which uh, surfaced how many of our libraries actually use uh, copy notes um, is this one. Uh, you have access in the new purchase order interface to uh, your line item notes as well as your purchase order notes. But if you have notes that are specific to copies, um, you can't actually see or add those anymore. Um, so that is a bug that came in in 310. Um, so if your library uses uh, copy notes, um, and often this is something that your vendor will include in um, the MARC files um, if, you, if your library is using those. Um, and it's one that we're looking into, we don't have a fix for it yet. Um, but uh, so there's that one. Um, we just ran into this one. Um, and again, this will depend on who actually uses selection lists. Um, We've discovered more of our libraries use selection lists than we thought um, since moving to 3.11 because of some of the things that they've encountered and reported back to us. Um, so there is a, a missing option to move items between selection lists. Um, but of course, if your library doesn't use uh, selection lists, uh, you won't run into this one. Um, with this, I did want to flag uh, one other thing we found with selection lists um, that I don't, I I haven't reported it as a bug because I don't, it's not really a bug, but um, the new selection list interface does different permission checks than it used to, and it does stricter permission checks. So there's permissions that it looks at now that it didn't used to. So if your library does use selection lists, um, if things aren't working, you might be missing the update pick list permission or the accept line item identifier. So I don't know if there's anyone else here who uses selection lists. We didn't realize some of our libraries were using them um, until they couldn't because they were missing these permissions. Um, and these permissions exist in Evergreen. It's just the selections list didn't used to require them. So our selectors didn't have those permissions. Um, and yeah, I I don't think it's a, like, I don't think it's a bug because the permissions are there. Um, but I just wanted to raise a little awareness about that in case others run into that. Because um, we were a little stumped to begin with as to why selection lists suddenly just weren't accessible for our users. 
it might be worth discussing also maybe a, a ticket to have those permissions added to the stock um, permission groups. And they, because it I, kind of is an expectation, I think. And we've noticed this with new, new development that that kind of a thing that we're having and you, you, Jennifer, probably actually, I think you did uh, come up with like a permission that was necessary to use a thing was not included in the stock permission group where you would just kind of naturally expect it to be there. And mm -hmm. so to have that updated. Um, yeah, I, I'll need to test the stock because we have completely different acquisitions permissions. Like we have done our completely own group, but yeah, I will check. Um, I'll check the stock and if they're not in there, I'll put it into Launchpad. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and then the other one, uh, this one, Tiffany does have a fix posted for. Um, we actually had to revert um, to older behavior when we went live. Um, so there is a fix posted for this one now, but we haven't had a chance to test it out because uh, she posted that December 13th. Um, so if you are, uh, if you have multi-branch libraries who use branch funds, if you're moving towards 311, um, make sure you check this out because when we went live, we discovered that our multi-branch libraries couldn't see any of their funds, um, which we had not uh, noticed in testing. Um, so uh, heads up if you're moving towards 311. Um, I'm pretty sure testing Tiffany's fix is on our uh, to-do list for uh, January, February. Um, you... Samantha, so that you had the same thing happen in, at NC Cardinal. And are, are you currently, to get around that, just setting up different workstations? No, we reverted the fix that changed how funds display in okay. the ACK purchase order. I don't know all the details, um, but yeah, we just reverted the fix so that it's looking at it the way it used to, which I think is what Tiffany's fix does. Um. It's always scary when it says this new branch now should behave the same way as Dojo. Well, Dojo was, I yeah, mean, yeah, there, I there's lots of things that, you know, are not great with Dojo, but, you know, sometimes the behavior of Dojo was what we it's needed. What we wanted, yep. Yeah. Um, I will say, uh, Samantha, that reverting whatever we reverted, we haven't had any issues since, um, other than the fact that we're now running a version of 3.11 that doesn't quite match main um and uh we try not to keep uh we try not to have customizations that we don't have to have because it makes it easier to maintain um uh, let me know samantha if you have questions because i can always poke our um, tech and ask him what he actually um, did for that Um, and there's a few others on here, um, that are, uh, nice to haves, uh, like returning the batch updater to the main page of the purchase order. Um, Tiffany recently reported one about being unable to receive canceled line items in the search. Um, so I think right now you can still do it. You just have to do it through the purchase order um, or the invoice rather than um, through the line item search. Um, so definitely worth uh, checking out the regressions list um, uh, if you are in the process of upgrading, uh, have just upgraded, thinking about upgrading, um, and also just if you're using acquisitions um, and you think these things will affect you in the future, please go ahead, give them heat. Um, make comments as well. Uh, so those are uh, 
the regression ones I wanted to highlight. Um, is there anything else in this list that others want to talk about? And apologies if you start to hear rumbling, the uh, large bobcat has come to remove all the snow we got. Okay, so with uh, 15 minutes, well, 13 minutes to go, um, we have a time for open discussion, um, which we've done a little bit through some of these bugs. Um, as well as a call for topics for February. Um, I'm also going to be hosting the February meetings. So if there's anything in particular that people want to talk about in February, whether you want to present on something or you want somebody else to present on something that you're interested in, um, please speak up or um, you can also contact me directly if you think of something after this meeting. Um, because I can, if if there are topics that people are interested in but not willing to present on, uh, depending on what it is, I might be able to put something together or, or so source somebody who um, can. I know this is a, you know, big thing to think about February and the second week of January. <laughs> um. Is there anything else acquisitions bug wise or such that's come up for anyone that they want to raise? All right, well, I think we'll just uh, end a few minutes early unless anyone has anything final, um, please do uh, send topics to the acquisitions list or you're welcome to send it to me directly if you don't want to send it to the open list. Um, and I'll just put my email into, does the, ch you know, okay, um, I'm going to stop the recording um, and the share apparently. Um, I have lost my task bar. There we go.